Hi, everyone. Welcome to this panel. Um, thank you for coming to the 39th annual Green Thumb Grow Together Conference. And welcome to all of you tuning in virtually. My name is Anthony Ryder. I'm the Assistant Director for Planning and Programming here at Green Thumb, where I oversee our special events, educational programming, garden visioning program, and more. I have the distinct honor of introducing our moderator for this afternoon's panel, Garden Legends, getting into the weeds with the community gardeners who grew a movement. Nancy Ortiz Sarun is an educator, a cultural artist, and a green thumb community gardener. Nancy helped to start La Finca del Sur in the Bronx in 2009 as part of a group of black and Latino women and their allies to help address the historic health and food access disparities in her community, growing food, advocating, and organizing for the past 13 seasons. Let's give a warm welcome to Nancy and the rest of our panelists. Thank you so much, Anthony, for that introduction. I'm truly honored to be sitting here with this panel of um, heroes and sheroes is the best way I can describe it. Um, and I wanted to um, have us, before we get into uh, hearing from this truly legendary garden panel, I wanted us to get energized, okay? So if you are a part of a community or garden, garden or aware of one in your neighborhood, please clap once, okay? If you have personally experienced peace, joy, or belonging in a garden, please clap twice. If you have ever been inspired to plant something, learn something, commit to something, or creatively, passionately represent or righteously resist something inspired by a garden leader, please make some noise. Okay, so we are, we are in the right place. This is a lot of good trouble up here, good and bad trouble. Um, Anyway, um, I want to um, welcome everyone to this conversation with five New York City garden legends whose lives inspire us to claim our right to health and well-being in our communities. New York City's farms and gardens are found in every borough and provide access to healthy local food, culture, bearing, beauty, information, and coalition wherever we are rooted. Today, we are honored to present and learn from these garden founders and visionaries. So we're going to go down the line. I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves. Microphone on. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, my name is Hodge Worley. I am the co-director of Project Harmony Incorporated and uh, here with my wife, Cindy. There we go. I'm Cindy Nibbling Worley, Hodges' wife, and co director and founder of Project Harmony and the Joseph Daniel Wilson Memorial Garden. That's where we're from. And we are activists and writers and educators. Where is the garden located? Oh, on 122nd Street in Harlem between 7th and 8th, or Adam Clayton Powell and Frederick Douglass Boulevard. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Shauna Gladden. I'm a second generation gardener and president of Dutton Community Garden in South Jamaica, Queens. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Is my mic on? Can you hear me? Yes. All righty. I bring you greetings from Bedford Stuyvesant in Central Brooklyn. My name is Ina K. McPherson, and I am uh, the founder of Tranquility Farm and Feeding Tree Garden in Bedford-Stuyvesant. I'm also closely um, connected lead instigator and head gardener at Four Gardens, PNT Vernon, Vernon and Troop, Tranquility Farm, and Feeding Tree. And I will stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Zoni Ortiz. 
I am the co-founder of La Isla Garden Greenies. I'm also the steward for La Isla Gardens as well as Sweet Gum Garden. And we're located in High Bridge, the Bronx. And it's both gardens are youth gardens. Thank you so much. Woo. I told you that this was a panel to be reckoned with. So um, I wanted to start by asking you um, how long you've been a member or a leader at your garden? Okay, uh, I've been a, a member of the Joseph Daniel Wilson Garden for approximately 30 years. My wife will correct me. Uh, approximately 30 years and uh, We've been, we've been, we had two gardens at one time. We had uh, 10,000 square feet of city owned property that we tended to. And so we've been around uh, quite a, quite a long time. We've been around since the, the, uh, the movement almost began to great, the, uh, the community garden movement, uh, which began down the lower east side and uh, at a place called Earth Celebrations. I don't know how many of you know Earth Celebrations, but, uh, but even before that, okay. Uh, yeah, well, it's been probably almost 37 years. We started in 1985. I met Hajo and I, I was at Malcolm King College and he also was um, in 1986, right? So you, 1986, I started with a group of youngsters basically, and Mr. Wilson, Mr. Joseph Daniel Wilson, who was my landlord in Harlem and was already close to 90 years old, so. Well, I've been a part of my gardening my entire life, um, but officially as a paying dues member since 2010, and then I became the president three years ago. So um, I have been a gardener my entire life um, in my backyard, but publicly gardening for over 25 years. Uh, two of our gardens have been around since um, the 80s, early 80s, and were part of the group of uh, gardens that were preserved during, before the Giuliani era. I've actually been a gardener. I'm a third generation gardener. My family owned a small piece of land and my grandmother um, taught me how to garden as her mother taught her. So there's a long history of gardening in my family. I've been in the garden that I'm at, at well, La Isla for about 30 years. Sweet gum is a new garden I just got, which I'm happy to have, which enables us to have some youth employment and programs for the young the young kids in the neighborhood of High Bridge. So I'm actually um, honoring my grandparents as well as my parents. So gardening is definitely in my blood. It is my passion, and um, I want to pass that passion on to our youth. It's not something that we keep to ourselves. It's something that we must give to our children. Because if we don't do that, the gardens will disappear, okay. as well as fresh food and healthy eating. Okay. Amen. Amen. And I, I just like to mention that Sonia is a 2022 um, awardee for her work with youth, um, honored by Green Thumb, and very well deserved. Okay. So going a little bit further, what led you to start? Um, as some of you have answered that question partially already to join this particular garden? And also what sparked your involvement in this movement? So we're asking you to add a little bit to your garden story. So um, let's start on this side, Ms. Ina and Sonia. So what started me getting into this movement was, I live in one of the poorest areas in New York City. I noticed the kids on the corner, they're either getting caught up in drugs or they're dropping out of high school. They're not motivated to do anything. So I started talking to the kids and the neighborhood that I live in, I grew up there from three years old. So most of the kids that are there, I either know their parents or their parents know my parents. 
So to keep the kids from going in the wrong direction to those things that we don't want them to go to, I started um, nurturing and finding out what their interests are. And if they didn't know about gardening, I brought them in to let them see that, you know, they have the ability to be more than just on a corner or unemployed or not getting a high school diploma or going to college. Because this is what was given to me as a child. It's each one teach one and you share what you have. Because if you don't share the wealth, you will never become wealthy. And when I say wealthy, I'm not talking about financially wealthy. Yeah. I'm talking about educationally wealthy. Something our kids do not get in the schools all the time. So we all got to chip in and do our part. But it basically was to motivate the kids and keep them away from the things, you know, and let them know that they deserve it. They are worthy. They do deserve a seat at the table. They have the, they should have the opportunity to drive that, that, that wheel on their car, you know, to success. And um, I just want to echo what Sonia is saying that the mentorship that garden legends and, you know, the uh, farmers and gardeners that they have mentored, you know, are, of vital and they are game changers for a lot of our youth. Um, Ms. Hina? Well, um, I, I came into gardening, public gardening for purely selfish motives. I moved to a community that I felt was really, you know, on its knees. And I saw an opportunity of using uh, gardening, horticulture to build community. And that involves children in the community. And so I use these gardens. I got involved with two gardens in my direct on the block that I moved. And we used it to really lift up the block. We built the infrastructure. We formed community. We, you know, <laughs> we started to relate to each other. And from, we started on the block and that pivoted into the gardens. And that's how we really build community and our gardens like Sonia, we're focused on the youth because if you do not lift up the youth and bring them into the garden, the movement is going to die. And so I, I never, never run out time. I have all the time in the world for the young people that come in the garden and you give them things to do in the garden so that they have a sense of ownership Every child or youth comes into our garden, plant something. And 20 years later, they'll pass by. Sometimes I don't even recognize them. They said, Mama, you know, you don't. I said, no. I said, oh, yeah, you're the one that used to smoke weed. <laughs> you come in. And they said, remember, you made me plant that tree. Where's my tree? And so, yes. So um, it's for me, it was a way of building community, building infrastructure, and 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 really education and you know fostering the next generation yeah thank you Ms. Sina. okay so i haven't been at this too long but i do know that when i look back at my experience growing up in the garden it gave me a sense of community it taught me service to my community and those are some of the things that I want to be able to give back to the kids that are coming up now. So I'm working to be where they're at right now. <laughs> You're off to a very good start, um, Shana. And uh, let me see. Okay, so basically this uh, wanting to give back, this learning right together intergenerationally is what I'm hearing that you're saying. About, yes. Yeah, your motivation. Yes. Okay, thank you. And same question, Cindy? Should yeah, I, I think certainly, it, you know, some of everything that has been said, but I think early on, Hodge said, you know, use the phrase, we're here to revitalize a great community. And, you know, just the little story behind it is that there were these horrible vacant lots across the street from Mr. Wilson's house where I live. There was a rumor there. And I said, Mr. Wilson, we have to make a garden. And I did not actually know about the gardens on the Lower East Side. I mean, I'd been in New York for a while, not that long. Um, and, but I went to the Harlem State Office building and they said, yeah, there's a group known as the Green Gorillas, somebody said, and I got in touch with them. Uh, and slowly we just started 
cleaning it up. Then a year later, we basically got in touch with Green Thumb again through, you know, asking around. And there was a program then in the city known as the City Volunteer Corps, the city CVCs. Uh, Haja can talk more also about the little guys in the community who helped him clean up mega stuff from our block um, and plant and all of that. Uh, but the CVCs was actually the City Volunteer Corps was a very good program run by the Department of Youth. And you could apply if you were any organization, I guess. Uh, for a group of young people, mostly they were either working toward getting their GED, they had dropped out of high school. They were wonderful, wonderful young people. And I mean, we hauled just loads of stuff off those vacant lots and of course planted our, our first uh, seeds. And on the day we went to plant, I said to them, look, we have to get everybody on the block to plant one thing. So they went to the stoops. People were all sitting on the stoops like, as they normally do, and there weren't nearly that many people in our block as there are now. And they all came out and planted one, one flower or one plant because we'd gotten a donation from the New York Botanical Garden, actually. Great ally organization. And then, you know, we had the Environment Rangers program that we've had consistently and various other programs with you. So partnerships have always been important, right? And this work. Yes, Haja. Okay, so uh, a little background. I uh, worked in Brooklyn at one point on something called the uh, Reclamation Project. And it was to reclaim uh, buildings that had gone into disrepair and stuff. And we would come in uh, on the weekends and clean them up and try to restore them. Uh, they were vacant buildings, but we, we didn't want to lead them as, as vacant. We didn't want to encourage people uh, to come in there and just use them as crack houses and stuff. We wanted to uh, we wanted to demonstrate some type of engagement in the community. In other words, we, we, we as the, as the kids say today, we were fronting. We were fronting and we were making believe that there was something going. Well, there was something going on, but we were trying to discourage just disuse. We were trying to make people see that there was a useful thing going on. I I met Cindy at uh, Malcolm King College, and uh, we had similar interests. Um, when she told me about the garden on 122nd Street, I. Uh, I was interested. And so I told her that I would help her, you know, clean the gardens, uh, help work in the gardens, et cetera. And I also had an ulterior motive. I wanted to get to know her better. So, so I, I, uh, I started helping out there. As she said, we worked with the CBC, the, the City Volunteer Corps. We worked with young people in in the neighborhood. Uh, and I think at the time, some of them were like nine years old to about 12 years old. And uh, some of these young people worked harder than the adults did. Uh, it was also, we, again, we were fronting. We were fronting. Uh, we wanted to demonstrate to the community that there was more going on than drug dealing. And it's a funny thing that right around the corner in our block was the 28th precinct, was the 28th precinct. Yet and still, there was drug traffic going on as though the police did not exist. There was a lot of drug traffic going on. And so we were, we were trying to discourage that. And occasionally people would ask us, what are you trying to do? Clean up the neighborhood as though that were a bad thing. And we said, yeah, that's exactly what we're, we're trying to do. And so uh, over the years, we grew and grew. And uh, there's just a number of things that we do in the garden. And, you know, we have uh, jazz concerts and, and just any number of things. And it has really become community over the years people have seen their investment grow in their neighborhood because the neighborhood began, uh, we were concerned uh, initially about gentrification, 
but as a result of the development of the houses and stuff, we got some good neighbors. And so we were happy about that. And so they're still with us and they're sticking with us and they really see their investment growing in the community. Thank you all. It's, it's just so powerful to hear how community gardens and farms and spaces like this are intersections of all sorts of um, healing, you know, alternative paths and education. Um, it, can't, it can't be overstated. Um, all right, so to you all, thank you all for those answers. Um, what's the most significant change in the New York City community garden movement that you personally have experienced over the years? Um, if you if you like anyone who feels called to that to answer first, the most significant change in New York City community garden movement that you've experienced. Well, I'll take that. Um, <laughs> the most significant change. Um, I live in uh, Bedford Stuyvesant, and it is a rapidly gentrifying neighborhood. And part of the outfall from this gentrification is the product that we have developed. And so we have to call a thing a thing. People have said to me, how do you feel about creating these spaces that have added so much value that poor people really can't live? I said, yeah, it's really, you know, it's a rock and a hard place, but I'd rather be on that side because there's always the opportunity to fix that and remediate it. Um, because of the, the rapidly gentrifying neighborhood, um, we have a Rolodex of you know, rolling um, membership. Uh, we see these kids come one season and the next season you'll hear from them. I said, oh, where are you? I said, well, I'm living in another community. So it's just a, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a door that keeps revolving. And so we try to see that in a more positive way of building, but it, it's concerned because uh, frankly, if I didn't own my house, I couldn't live in my neighborhood. I couldn't afford the rents. And it's because our gardens are used to sell buildings. We've seen it in the, um, the advertisement that they make to sell these properties. They say, beautiful community garden a block away. People come, you know, there's a huge building in front of um, Tranquility Farm, and they will come to me and say, can you help me to get into the apart that building? I said, I don't even know who owns that building because it's an LLC and, you know, they hide behind the LLC. And so, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a concern, um, but we see it in the sense that we're adding value. Community gardeners add value to New York City infrastructure. We build and we add real tangible value to whatever goes on in the city. And we are a volunteer force. We operate, we don't get paid. We're not a paid staff. Everybody gets paid except us. And we turn up every single day and we're there on from sunup to sundown. And so we created this movement that of really, um, cause a resurgence in the city. And then um, sometimes we don't get the support that we think we ought to get, but there is, you know, we're thankful for Green Thumb, Green Gorillas, Grow NYC, and all our good supporters, our enablers that help us to do this work. Um, yeah. I don't want to go on too long. <laughs> Thank you, Mathina. No, that's, huh? that's it's, it's something yes, that- Yes, yes, Brooklyn Botanic Garden and the Bronx Botanic oh. Gardens. These are all the museums, uh, horticultural spaces in our community that really uh, supports the work that we do. They have components that give us the best plants and, um, you know, support, technical support and all of that. Thank you. Yes. It's hard, it's hard to keep up with the changes, right? That this added value produces. Yeah. Um, does anybody else want to take a stab at this question? I think Sonia wants to add. Just okay. basically to okay. reiterate. Okay, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Can I go to Sonia and then to yourself? Oh, okay. so for me, it the difference is the kids. Because in all the years that I've been doing this work, every child that's coming into the garden has either going to college, like last year, I sent a bunch of kids off to college. So like she says, it's a different kind of kids. 
every year. The, the most negative and sad thing that bothers me is that our kids now come to the garden for, for educational stuff. They're not being taught how to write their name in script, so that teaches them how to be a victim. They're not taught that in school script is. So it's teaching them how to be a victim. And when I say a victim, it's easy to steal their identity. You know, and that's very sad. So we have like a small program in the garden. Whatever kids come into contact with me, I teach them how to spell their name in script so that they cannot, you know, that's a starting point in their life. And, you know, for somebody to rob you of your identity, it's hard enough for an adult to combat that. But imagine a 14-year-old or 15-year-old whose identity is being stolen. But um, another positive change is, you know, we're, we're thanking, but we also need to um, thank the staff that work with us through these various agencies because we get a lot of support from them. Mm -hmm. So we need to also acknowledge them and, and because we can't do these things alone. Right. None of us are islands. And another significant change for me has been, you know, um, the connectivity between the gardens. Right. Okay, um, nobody's gonna fight for us more or better than we can fight for us. And nobody's gonna speak for us better than we can speak for us. You know, that's part of the reason I said I'm sitting on this panel today. Right. And respectfully, Sonia, I'm going to stop you there because we have a question just along those lines further down. So thank you for that, ladies. And Cindy, thank you for your patience. Yes. Partnership is a beautiful thing. <laughs> I <have a> question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think basically um, my two esteemed colleagues over there said it. <clears throat> Just generally, community garden ha gardening has become, you know, more fashionable than than it was back then. I think that's what I wanted to add, and it's it's sometimes a double edged sword. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, that's I'll leave it there. We try to keep it on the positive, right? Okay. Um, the uh, as I think I mentioned before, you know, people uh, have begun to see community gardens as an investment. And whereas people like Giuliani once called us communists and hippies, you know, uh, people in the community now see the value of community gardens. They see their connection. Uh, they see their investment. Investments are growing, communities are growing. Uh, because if you take care of a piece of land, it encourages people to take care of where they live, I think. And so uh, I've seen the, uh, the community gardens grow over time. The community garden movement has grown over time. Now we're at a place where we're kind of like idling, if you will. We're kind of like idling because, you know, there's, there's uh, not mass movement at this time around community gardens going on. Uh, when we were when we were dealing early on every week, there was uh, just about there was a demonstration or something. Now we're kind of idling, you know. We, we're we're kind of, for lack of a better word, we're kind of complacent at this particular point. But uh, we're in idle, but we're stable. We're stable. Mm, thank you, Roger. Um, so the only thing I was going to add to that was uh, agreeing with what was already said is um, the community gardens now communicate with each other a lot more. Um, I, I often talk to the board about some of the things that I do with Green Thumb or Brooklyn Queens Land Trust, and they're just like, wow, you're actually meeting other uh, gardens um, and being able to compare uh, situations or just learn from them so for them that's that's a huge thing um, just to uh ask um shana uh, is your garden a, a brooklyn queen's land trust garden okay all right thank you um all right 
So we've touched on some of these things with the prior question, um, but compared to when you first started um, as a New York City community gardener, how is it better now? And like I said, some of these points have been touched on. So, you know, answer if you feel called to, how is it better and how does it need to change? All right, how do we, how do we address some of these issues that um, you all have brought up? I'm wondering. Okay, I think, I think we need to, uh, we need to think about the future. We need to think about the youth. We need to think about young people. We need to think about the future. We need to think about uh, the long-term existence of gardens as a value to the community. The long-term, uh, uh, you know, long-term existence. You know that these should become as much a part of our landscape as the city parks and stuff, if not more so. Is it something? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, along those lines, um, how it's become better, I think, is that there's just much more, um, much more talk, you know, much more, I forget what, what word I want to use. There's, like I said before, community garden has really, be gardening has really become a very popular thing, um, you know, not only because Food justice is a very important um, <clears throat> thing that I think has come into the forefront. Um, but, you know, I guess Michelle Obama made gardening and community gardening. And uh, I think people have begun to recognize that building community, having a little a hub is just so good for, you know, any neighborhood. Um, in terms of the community gardens, yeah, what still needs to happen, I think, uh, you know, speaking specifically, I guess, of New York City, but probably across the nation, uh, I think, well, one thing just, you know, locally going to our license, there is a clause in the license which says, notwithstanding all the above words to that effect, <clears throat> Uh, the commissioner at will can basically take back the garden. And I, and I think a few other people feel very strongly that, you know, we have to be able to change that clause and, you know, it needs to be qualified. You know, what would constitute whatever that would make the commissioner decide that community garden has to go. It seems like it kind of negates the really positive aspects, if we can say it like that, of the license. Um, you know, there is talk about returning the license to leases uh, because it gives the, the people who are the volunteers in the garden more uh, autonomy, uh, a lease would. Uh, I think that's, you know, an open question. And certainly I've had lawyers tell me, oh, you will never change that. But like I used to say to Bill Lasasso, everything can change. <laughs> He'd say, so, it's the one constant, right? Change is the one constant in life. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Donna, anything to add? Okay, ladies. Well, from my perspective, um, well, I have a lot to say about the subject, but I'll only stick with two, uh, is that there ought to be more focus on horticulture in gardens. We have, we fought for these spaces and we have the capacity to really, even in a small area, grow edible food. And when we grow the edible food, we're supposed to be eating it, not just growing it for show. My pet peeve is going to gardens, you see beautiful tomatoes and they're just dying on the vine. You harvest, once you harvest, you, the plant puts out more. And so um, it's important that we, we just don't plant flowers. We need flowers because if we don't plant flowers, we can't have food because it's the pollinators. But we can really grow a lot of stuff. You wouldn't believe the stuff that we grow in our garden. Pumpkins, garlic, tomato. I mean, we have pumpkins walking out the door, you know, out the gate. 
Um, we have so many fruit trees. So order, there ought to be an emphasis on horticulture. Grow food, 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 you know, hunger is a huge problem in this country. And from just one bed that's seven by, what, eight by four, you can really feed a family of, you know, two or three people and you could grow so much collard greens, so much chard and from seeds. You don't have to have a lot of money to grow food. <laughs> you know, you can just buy a packet of seeds, make sure it's open pollinated, it's good seed and compost. Pay attention to the soil. My second um, pet peeve is um, the, the, you know, the impersonal way of how elders, you know, such as ourselves in this movement. Um, uh, we, it has to be more recognition, more one-on-one -on -one recognition. Um, I don't want to pick on Green Thumb here, but, you know, our, <laughs> our coordinators need to know every elder. Check with us. Check in with us. Not because it's your job. Check in with us on the weekend. How are you doing? Is there anything that you need? Because our movement created this agency. It is the work that gardeners such as ourselves here that created a whole city agency. Can you imagine? Green Thumb was created based on our work. And you know, I wanna shout out Haj and Cindy. They, I'm just a baby advocate here, but they were at the beginning of the movement. You know, they're not gonna tell you, but oh my God, so much history lie in these two people here. And so, yeah, you know, elevate us, give us names. I went to a movie this morning that all the gardeners were impersonal. Nobody, there's no name, no garden, no gardeners. And so it's, you know, it's an impersonal way of dealing with, um, you know, the stakeholders. It's important. We really sacrifice and we work so hard to create this movement. And so it should not be second thought. And so I get off my... Soapbox. Oh. <laughs> I just want to um, say before we get to Sonia, who's waiting very patiently. So, Messina, I'm hearing in what you say two things. You know, we have a, a, a problem that we are aware of in the um, community gardening uh, movement about space for generations. And, you know, I have a saying that we need the experience of the elders and the energy of youth. That's the perfect combination, in my humble opinion, right? To keep these gardens sustainable, to make sure that succession happens in an informed way. And it's a very natural setting for generations that don't normally, you know, hang out together to come together and, and learn from each other. And the other thing that um, you touched on was the, you know, the waste of food, the ornamental quality mm -hmm. of food in some gardens. Um, I'm a very strong proponent of cooking, mm -hmm. you know, cooking experiences in the garden. So if we're looking at ways to expand, uh, you know, uh, organizations uh, support, you know, like Green Thumbs and uh, the Botanical Gardens and um, Green Gorillas, I would say that's an area. You know, people, everyone eats. Everyone is fascinated by food and the things that we grow in our gardens are amazing, you know? I mean, go to Whole Foods and price the kind of produce that we grow in our community gardens. Okay, so this is for our health, this is for you know, education, this is for bringing people together over a table. So that's what I thought of. Yeah, I just wanna add on also to piggyback on what you said about the seniors, you know, we're tough with these old timers in the gardens. We put up a wall, you can't get in, right? Mm. I have to work on myself with that because it comes naturally. We created this, these spaces at great cost to you know, our health and our will and everything. And so we have a tendency to hang on too long. And so the danger is these old people, we old people, we try to keep the young people out. And so you, we put up a wall, but you have to humble yourselves and work with the agency to get beyond that. Don't start gang up on us and say, you know, that big B whatever, just humble yourselves and find a way to be friendly to us and, and you could come in. And once you come in and you show that you really have a very strong work ethic, because this is not for the faint of art. Community gardening is not for the faint of art. I mean, it's really hard work. And you know, if you don't really have a strong work ethic and yes, so this instance of these old timers in the gardens that will not leave 
and Green Thumb has a problem in ushering us out because we are like planted. But I would suggest that the agency with care and respect try to transition, transition us out and help us to build the young generation because you are all the future. But don't give up that big wall, get beyond the wall. Thank you, Latina. So I'm a little bit different. I'm an older person, I'm 63 years old. I think that as we grow, for well, me in particular, I'm that person who the kid in me never died. You know, because as a minority, I'm the oldest of 12. So it is a lot of things that I had to cram into that I didn't get to do. So when it comes to youth, I understand them. I speak their same language because I want them to teach me the same way I want to teach them. I want to learn from them. And I think the problem comes in when we as elders and, you know, because we have to take ownership of what we do as well. We as owners sometimes talk to the youth and they're intimidated. You know, in order to, to teach them, you, ought to, you also have to be open to learning from them. Even if we may not agree with what they're saying to you, you still have to have that conversation. So I kind of agree with almost everything said here, but I'm a person that thinks outside of the box. I'm always, I'm, I've always been good at finding back doors when it comes to, you know, like somebody tells you something, you ever hear the parents say, don't ever let anybody tell you you can't do this because you can do whatever you put your mind to. Yep. Well, that has been banged into me through three generations of strong women. So I'm always looking for a new way. But what I wanted to say here today too is we, we don't have to wait for anybody to show us how to do things. What we need to do is work on our coalition building and strengthen those and tie our youth to that. Yes, yes. Because if we're strong, we can teach our kids to be strong. Right. And they can emulate the process and they can also, this is how much I believe in you, I uh, also believe they can keep it going, but I also think they can improve it. Exactly. And I say that to them. Mm -hmm. You know, because sometimes we speak to them and you have, a, for me, when you speak to a child, are we speaking at them or speaking to them? Right. When we speak to them or they're speaking to us or listening to them. Right. Or, and, are, and are we like, like versa, them? But I'm that's, sorry. this is, this is how, because I ask them yeah. and this is how you perceive that. And what happens is they become combative because mm -hmm. they've already got enough strikes against them in life. People telling them, you can't do this, you can't do that. Oh, because I said so, you're a child. You know, they have that and it's hard for them. But when you have somebody that's willing to listen to you, we don't have to agree with everything you say, but just sometimes having that sounding board and that person you can go to that you feel that you could trust them and they're gonna respect what you say to them. They don't have to necessarily agree because respect is a mutual thing. Right. So I'm a lot different. And maybe because I'm the oldest of 12, and I know what that's like to have a lot of responsibility, but I'm more comfortable around, I think the child in me never died right. because right. there's a lot of things that I never got to do as a child, but the gardening was my release. Right, and Sonia, if I may say, because you're in that position, you also have the experience of leading by example. And there's a lot that can be gained by, you know, not saying all the time, but you know, what you exemplify, right? And the the, the example that you lead with in that garden. You know, knowing Sonia and all these uh, gardeners, I know that that's a very powerful um, tool in working with young people. Um, at this point, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit because there, community gardening and farming is a wonderful, um, it's an asset, right? It's a wonderful, beneficial, health-giving thing, but there are conflicts, right? Not only among generations, um, but differences. Um, just because New York is a big city, because we have different moving parts. And I wanted to ask you all, what do you see um, as differences as well as common ground between boroughs? And this is something that comes up. So, I mean, I don't know if you all wanna think on that, if anybody wants to take a stab at that, if we don't all have something to say about it, but 
you know, it's a big terrain. It's a big area. How do we bring, you know, these talents and these thoughts together and sort of find ways to narrow those differences that sometimes come up? Can I take that? Well, I mean, I think coalition, you know, I like think Sonia was said. getting ready to speak. Oh, Missy, sorry. if you don't mind, yeah. and then. Um, I think that, um, okay, I think that uh, we, as far as the, uh, there's always, uh, for lack of a better term, intramural uh, competition, uh, sort of between the boroughs, okay? Some say that uh, Brooklyn's got the most gardens and does the most work and say, yeah, rah, rah, you know, Brooklyn. And uh, some say that, you know, uh, Bronx is, 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 is underserved. Uh, Manhattan is, 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 is not underserved somewhere in the middle, but uh, there's, there's, there's I, I guess it's healthy competition, you know what I'm saying, among the gardens. And uh, we want to, uh, we, we, we want to organize, I like the way, I like the, the, uh, the idea of meeting in gardens around the, the, uh, the boroughs. I have been to gardens in Brooklyn, I've been to England's garden. I don't know if I've been to a garden here or where. South Jamaica. I, I have been through South Bay, but I haven't been to the gardens out there. And uh, the sister down there, what garden you in? You in? Okay, all right. And I do know the garden that Nancy works with. El Finco de So? Yes. De so I, yes. No, I don't tell the language. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's very good. It, it is. Uh, it is, you know, that's what I like, the uh, the coordination and the collaboration between the gardens that show we're all in this thing collectively, you know? If it's a competition, let it be a healthy competition, see who grows the best tomatoes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we're all working in this thing together. And I like that, I like that a lot, that we're united, you know, the gardeners are united. And uh, I really enjoy that. Thank you. And Haja, if you grow the best tomatoes, I'm going to ask you to teach me. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Ina? Well, Haj, uh, you know, just covered what I wanted to say is that coalition building is really important. Gardeners need to be talking to each other. Um, we, you know, we, we, we flourish in collaboration and we, we diminish in isolation. So um, you really need to talk to your fellow gardener, buddy up when you're going to go pick up stuff. You plant, you exchange seeds, and just build coalition across the borders. Um, you know, we're all different, um, but the same in, this, in the sense. There are differences in um, gardens um, with class and race, even among membership uh, people from the Caribbean. I'm from Jamaica. And there is a difference between people from down south and people from the Caribbean, and we will not acknowledge it. It exists, but you work on building bridges and you know coming together and um, working on and um, having better relations. I mean, I've been in my uh, our group of gardens for over twenty five years, and we started out with five women. African American property, and you know we're known as the Vernon Avenue Garden Ladies, and we have been up and down, up and down, and we're in a sweet spot now because we seem we've all grown old together. I'm the oldest, well, second oldest, and um, so it's not easy. So you know you really do experience differences, even though you look the same, but there are real deep differences between. Um, people from the Caribbean and people from down south. And so somehow, you know, and yes, I'm guilty of that too, but so you work on it. So it's, it's all, it's important to build bridges, 
humble yourself, take time off, and then you come back together. Because the remaining thing, the current that's running through, we all love horticulture and gardening. And, and that's what really holds us together. Thank you so yes. much. I'm just realizing we could spend 90 minutes with each one of these gardening legends. Um, and I would ask um, if you haven't responded, if you have one quick thing to say about this topic that hasn't maybe hasn't been said before. So coalition building, right? Communication, right? Visiting. Yes. So I don't know. Okay. Uh, I just want to say community gardens, I think, harmonize differences. I think, you know, people working together. I have seen people who I know they really are a little frosty to each other, but they get in and they end up being the best friends. And I think I love going to all the community gardens and seeing all the differences. One year for our anniversary, we just toured community gardens. Oh, that's that was great. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Oh yeah, for I think 17 years, we did a Harlem garden tour, mm. um, which really was a lovely thing. And, you know, we kind of didn't have funds for the buses because we had to take buses because our gardens are not really, really close together. Right. You know, a few are here and there, but yeah. Um, yeah so that also I think was a, a great harmonizer. Yeah, we have something similar in the Bronx. I don't know if in Queens you have something similar. Thank you, Cindy. No, we don't actually. I, I wish we did. Um, I've worked back and forth with some of the gardens um, in South Jamaica a mm -hmm. lot. Um, and to be honest with you, I think part of it is because um, on the younger side of the scale, some of them just need help from younger occupants coming in and just helping out and doing stuff with them like Marsden. And then also supporting some of the gardens that recently just opened up as well. Yeah, so a, a mentoring of type. Yeah, I think it's so valuable. I'm yeah. glad that that's happening there and I have to get to Queens. Yep. Yes. <laughs> and Sonia, anything? So I've heard everything up here, but support for one another. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to build a coalition and you want a strong one, you need to support and when And I'm talking about the type of support where Everybody in the garden doesn't have the same needs. Okay, and this is something that I feel strongly about. And it's something that needs to be said. We do not all have the same needs. And sometimes we have to sit back and assess who has the greater need. And sometimes that calls for sacrifices, not just on behalf of the people who help us, but on behalf of us. Mm -hmm. Because if I have a sister garden, or a garden that's part of that coalition and they they have a greater need than, than I do, that deserves to be recognized and it also deserves to be addressed. Right, right. So in, in terms of support, it's, it's physically, financially, and mentally to make sure that we're all stable because any part of the coalition that's weak, it weakens us all. Right. And people need to recognize that and take ownership of it. As gardeners, as people that support us as gardeners, they need to take ownership of it because we're only as great as the support or the help that we get. And if one of us stumbles, we all stumble. Right, right. So it's such great cases, right? For um, being really aligned with each other, in tune with each other, um, just informed, right? About what's happening all across this beautiful scope of work that we do. Um, let me see, I'm trying to prioritize here. Okay, this is something that I really want to know. All right, what is one, and we're, we're, we're gonna pick the one, the strongest one, the personal quality or skill that you see in yourself, your superpower, and how it helps you to build trust and collaboration, engage in, uh, community members and partners and adversaries at times. Okay, so what is that quality that you feel you have, because we have a diverse group here. We have civic leaders, we have artists, we have activists, we have business people. I mean, this the scope of this small panel here is amazing. So what is your one superpower and how do you use it, right? To be able to um, create this positivity, especially collaboration and communication. 
among you, right, with those who are with you and those who are maybe against you for a while. Uh, I think you know, my uh, would have a superpower. It would be uh, vision, uh, having vision to see, to imagine things uh, becoming better and then to work toward that goal. I go to sleep, I wake up sometimes because we do a lot of organizing, Cindy and I, and I wake up sometimes in the middle of the night and I say, Cindy, I had this dream and it always has to do with, with, with organizing of some sort. And so, but I believe in vision, having vision, seeing something uh, that you would want to see and then find out ways and means that you can make a part of it happen and then connect to other people who might be doing something similar or the same as what you're doing and build upon it, build upon it step by step. There's always something happening. There's always something going on in our communities that we can latch on to that can help us further our interests. We just have to have the vision to see it. And so I think vision is healthy. If you go to sleep and you dream about it, that's good. I love it. I love it. Okay, so we're going to go down this line like if we were speed dating. Okay, <laughs> so Cindy, your superpower. Okay, how do you use it? I would say openness and optimism. I mean, kind of together. I'm always the person who says, no, we can do it. We can fix it. And sure, come on in. Yeah, you want to help? You know, just a case in point, you know, we have chickens. We've got about 20 people who help with the chickens. Not all every day, to be sure. You know, there are regular people who have a day. So Monday through yeah. Sunday, everything is covered. One day, a young woman came in, and I mean, like, I'm saying, she's the one. She's it, you know. We had a great talk. I said, I'll add you to the list. And I'll have Greg, you know, Greg takes them through the rigmarole of what to do with the chickens each day. And she never came back, oh. <laughs> you know, but it's okay. Yeah. It's fine. That was a positive thing, you know. Exactly. Uh, she might come back. Yep. You know, something happened and she just couldn't come back. But that door is open. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That's a superpower. Okay, Ms. Shana. Um, so for me, it's probably creativity. Um, so far, I've been able to do events and partnerships with people that um, at, at the time the board wasn't thinking to even do and they, they actually turned out great. We've got new membership, we've gotten um, people that have come around that just probably walked past the garden and didn't say anything. So it's being creative. Excellent. I can, I can um, identify with that. I love arts in the garden. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I once read a quote that says, um, gardeners dream bigger, have bigger dreams than emperors. <laughs> gardeners have bigger dreams than emperors. Amen. My superpower is all of what Hajj said, but I'm not warm and fuzzy, but I am kind. Mm. I'm kind. Even when you see people are coming at you, can't pick a fight with me. You can't pick a fight with me. I kill you with kindness. Everyone that comes to our garden leaves with something and they remember it. So I would say my superpower is vision and kindness. Love it. Ms. Sonia? Oh, it's hard for me. I'm going to say like legend. Surprise me. Surprise me here. What's your superpower? But but that's that's not it. No, it is actually it's a combination of things. You What's know, the strongest? The strongest. What with me, one thing can't survive without the other. You know. So if you if your my superpower is organizing and advocacy, but it's also nurturing. Those three things cannot survive without each other. Mm. 
So when you ask me one, it's it's kind of hard to say one. Okay, so what's the trilogy? What's that trilogy? It's organizing, act, advocacy, and nurturing. All right. Those three things cannot survive because if you're dealing with kids, you have to know how to nurture. And if you know how to nurture, you can also teach them to organize and advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that makes them the stronger person. It makes them a stronger. That's even with adults. Mm. That's a formula that works with whatever situation yeah. you find yourself in. Because each thing is codependent on the other in order for it to be successful. Mm -hmm. And, so, that's, and that's why you were honored last year, Miss God, because you do it so well. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Sonia. <laughs> okay, um, here's something you know that's up for it's an open, open um, question. Um, could you share one experience or event that you was witnessed during the height of the pandemic and how it affected your garden? So, just something that that impressed you. It, like I said, it's an open question. You can answer the past, or I think we were all affected, but. Well, I would say during the pandemic, we were closed. You know, we really had here because we are sort of a, an aging demographic. Most of the leaders in our gardens are seniors, and we did not want to take the chance of, um, you know, and we just had here strictly to the rules that Green Thumb uh, handed down to us. But I could tell you it was our most um, uh, productive season growing. Mm -hmm. My goodness, we grew so much food, so much food that we didn't even, we, we, we had a little farm stand and we stopped that. We just gave, gave away everything, put it on the, the, the curb, on the table and closed the gate. But the hardest part was gardening behind closed doors, um, closed gates but it was our most prolific season growing in all the 20 years that we were there because we were focused on gardening, gardening. Mm -hmm. But it was very sad that the community outside was, yeah, yes. so, yeah, for us. Thank you, Ina. I think for us, it was, uh, for me anyway, it was the ability to get out, uh, you know, get out not to feel confined, to get out and just you know, meditate, reflect in the garden and just, you know, just sit there to enjoy it, you know, because uh, we're right across the street from our garden. Yeah. And it, you know, just getting out was good and then. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I would say, you know, I think the garden, in a sense, saved lives during the pandemic because we didn't have a completely closed door policy, but just very few people could go in at one time. And people just used the garden as a refuge, you know, to get away from those four walls. And, you know, people continue to bring their compost and so on because they don't all bring it at once. You know? So. Mm. Well, I became the president during the pandemic in the garden um, and our board was actually a little scattered. We had lost two founding members of the garden um, and it just seemed like nobody wanted to do anything. So I would go into the garden, um, one, to meditate, to just be close to those we have lost um, because they, they were the heart of our garden. Um, it was different, but me going in and saying, hey, we can scatter our schedule. You guys can still come in and figure out a way. And just them seeing me constantly go in and me saying, hey, I'm here, y'all. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. They started to come in and it was kind of like, a, okay, it's okay for us to be in this space, even though our friends and family is gone, we can be here. And in those, in that getting them back into the garden, I started to make sure I had ways to remember those we lost. So we have two sections of the garden now dedicated to both of them, so. So sorry for your loss. It's too common a story, right? During this, this time. So Anthony, yeah, I'm getting a cue. Okay, so we have a few questions from the 
our audience here. Um, all right. Um, I would say in the interest of trying to answer as many questions as possible, that you have one more. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, so I would just say, let's really like make our answers concise. And like I said, speed dating, think speed dating. <laughs> These are important issues though. As a younger gardener, what should I be doing so that we don't remain complacent and continue to push this movement forward? Okay, so if you can think of one thing you can tell this young gardener. Can I answer? Yes. So sure. one of the things that I've been doing is constantly reaching out to community-based organizations um, and listen, um, trying to get their help with either doing events in our garden or, in our garden or having their membership come and volunteer for a day in the garden. Um, it what it, it has done is like once they leave out of that garden, they're they're now hosting on this place, that place, and now I have other community-based organizations saying, can we hold events in the garden or can you just partner? Maybe your garden can sponsor events. We're sponsoring uh an event next. Friday for uh, Easter Day something I forget but it's it's how we've been trying to keep the name relevant and possibly recruit more people into the garden. Brilliant! I love that advice. So I think because we have a few here, maybe if two of us could answer each question. So thank you for that, Shana. Would anybody else like to give some advice to this? Yeah, I would like garden? to um, add to that is yeah engaging with the youths. Uh, connect. Uh, all gardens should be connected to a school. If you're not connected to a school, you're really not functioning. <laughs> yes, you have to connect and engage with the young people and have days. We have ceremonies. Last year, we hosted uh, an event where we had um, uh, sort of a grief session for um, families that had lost um, family members to violence. And they came in, it was like a workshop, interactive workshop. And and we build so much community from that. So, you know, just a regular man walking by the garden, um, you can engage with them and connect them with, um, and schools, yes, go to a school and offer your services for them to come tour and just community engagement. That's all, community engagement. Thank you. So a younger person could also be an ambassador for that garden, right? Absolutely. They, right? You can go yes, into, yes, yes. Your yeah. school or your training program, your workspace, right? Your your home, your family, and bring people to that garden. That's a great way and something I'm picking up from what you're saying, Messina. Yeah. Okay, so we'll have this next question for two people that have not answered the prior one. What are the main challenges you're facing in your gardens in 2023? Okay, so two, two panelists to take that. The main challenges, you're you all don't have challenges. Main, <laughs> main challenges you're facing in 2020. No, I'll give you time to think. Yes. Well, mine, mine's is membership and getting people to come in and actually stay. I may get them mm -hmm. for an entire year and then next year they may or may or not come back or when they do come back, it's very scattered. Yeah. So I end up having to take care of their box. Yeah, do you think it's a combination of true, true time constraints? Because we all have right pressures in our lives, but also that farming and gardening seem kind of glamorous and sometimes that hard work. I think it's the second part. Oh, okay, or a combination. Thank you, Shana. Haja? Uh, yeah, I think um, for us, Management is a challenge. Managing the people who want to join versus the people that are already there. Managing, managing time. No, go ahead. Management. I mean, management of the people that are that are already there at the garden. Well, I think you're all doing great. <laughs> okay. okay. I don't wait. Get it. No, I'm saying. Yeah. We have people already there at the yeah. garden. We're managing quite fine. People that would come in, in terms of- in terms Oh, of hypothetically speaking, I guess. Yeah, exactly. What are you saying? Um, but it usually just works out. I mean, uh, you know, people aren't, you know, aren't um, 
rude or anything who come in and I think usually they, they're eager to learn. So I guess it's a challenge in a way because you have to spend a little more time with them or someone does maybe. But it, it really, I think it works out. I think there are times too when we have a situation, an event happening where people say, well, we want to have 60 people and we really oh, yeah, that happens built for that. Our garden is, well, when Pete Seaver came, we had 100. Mm -hmm. so, There's the unpredictable nature, right, of all of this. Thank you. All right, so, um, Sonia. How is food, I'm gonna direct this to you. How is food distributed from your garden? Who consumes it? How can we all be uh, collaborate better to address food insecurity and produce more for more people? Like if you had to give the short, concise answer to that, what would it be? So food is distributed. I live in one of the poorest districts in the Bronx, the West Bronx. It's like, I'm sure everybody knows where Yankee Stadium is. Well, way over on the upside of Yankee Stadium is where I live. And there's a lot of food insecurity over there, food disparity, no juice bars. The food don't look like, the, the vegetables don't look like what comes out the ground. It's like you, the worst possible vegetables you could get, unless it's coming out of a community garden. I wanna be clear about that because we have a couple of them over there. But how we distribute food over there is we grow it, they come and get it, and there's no charge. Because we have a lot of kids. We have like 27 shelters over here. So you got some kids, they don't have available food fresh to them. But if you if if they see what it looks like and they're like, mm, this is good, they're gonna want to grow it. You know what I'm saying? Because they don't have the ability to pay for it. Or some parents don't have the ability to do that. There's no shame in being poor. The shame is when you're poor and you don't do nothing about it. Or when you don't have your ability to not have. It's not a shame, the ability to not have it and try to get it, be it grow it yourself, learn how to grow it. And if it's if, if it's free, you know, you got people that'll come and donate their time just because they're able to eat that night or they ate their, their availability of fresh vegetables. So Sonia, what I'm hearing, so it sounds like you have some sort of pick your own option do you do uh, food shares at all? Um, do the youth put together shares for? We have cherry picking, like people will come, they'll pick cherries for everybody. We have communal box. That means everything that's grown in that box is specifically grown for the community. Yes. Okay. And then you have people that have their own boxes. Mm -hmm. So if you have your own box and you grow your own food, you're responsible for your own food. It's, you know, when we have bylaws and we have rules, okay? If you have your own box, it don't make no sense for you to take from the communal. What's right. better for the communal? Right. The communal is just what it says. It's for the community. Yes. Um, we also have the ability, what's helpful for us too, is we have summer youth. Those kids would not have jobs if not for the garden in my area because there is no place over there to go get jobs. Mm. And and if there are, they're very few. Right. So, you know, you have to find different ways of making things work. Yeah. I mean, it's a sad story. Don't get me wrong. I love where I live. I love my hood. Okay, as the kids say. But, you know, we got to stop waiting around for people to do things for us. You know, like they say, build it, they'll come. Right. Sometimes you gotta build it yourself. Exactly. And uh, going back to our earlier question about collaboration, um, is there any short answer to how we can collaborate better to address uh, this food insecurity in our in our neighborhoods? I think I think. Uh, as far as food security is concerned, I think that if we are, like we have a CSA, which uh, people pay and Cindy can speak more than that, to that. But we also have a people's market, which we have, uh, uh, we sell produce for a price, usually a very small price and stuff, Cindy can speak to that. Yeah, the, with the people's market, there are a lot of people who 
probably don't want to do the CSA for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, ultimately you, you do get your produce for less money, but you have to put it out a little yes. bit more at a time. And so we try to sell everything we say for a dollar with at the pumpkin or a watermelon for a dollar or 25 or 30 potatoes for a dollar, mm -hmm. you know, and people, you know, sometimes when you're giving away things, people think, oh, it's only for a certain person, not for me. You know, sometimes they'll even ask when they see the poster, they'll say, um, is that for people who don't have EBT? You know, they say it's for everybody because everybody is hurting a bit with the inflated food prices. So that's something we try to keep going. And in doing that, it's not just produce from the garden because we don't really grow enough for that. Uh, for a long time, we've had a CSA and we partner with a small farmer from upstate. And, you know, we have to support our small organic farmers. And we feel good about that because we're all supporting him. We're collaborating with him. And, you know, in saying that collaboration in whatever way one can do it is just so important. And they're all different types of need, right? Um, and right, different ways to address it. And I think community gardens do that pretty successfully. Um, all right, so what do you think about increasing development of vacant um, land, lack of empty space for gardens, and how can we go about creating new gardens? That's like a whole green thumb workshop, right? Okay, what, <laughs> what have you uh, learned about how to challenge land grabbing? Okay, so I don't, um, I'm not sure how to interpret that. Land grabbing by gardens, land grabbing by developers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Developers, like developers. Yeah. Um, or the scourge. Okay. Or the scourge. Um, yeah, Sonia, your mind, microphone, sorry. sorry. People that just don't want to garden in the neighborhood yes. or, you know, like I had one developer tell me, oh, um, we could get that land to build here. And I'm like, no, you yeah, can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why can't we? I said, because we're in the parks. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we need to go look somewhere else. It's always... Sometimes it's the people in the community that don't fight, okay? Or they fight, but they feel like they're not being heard. So it doesn't encourage them to stick with it. Right. Sometimes it's people that are not from our community, but mm -hmm. land on our community so that they can co-op the benefits that are there for the people that are from that community. Right, right. You know, um, it, it's not just in land. It's about money. Right. It's always about money. You, you can say it's about that land, but it's not about the land. It's about this. Right. That's okay. Different. It's always saying that it's a thing, but that thing is really, it's like the that word land yeah. is just put, being put in place of the value. Right. Or the equity, yep. okay. for lack of a better word. Thank you, Sonia. Let's hear what Ina has to yeah, say. Yeah, I just want to add that, you know, developers, you're the scourge of the land. You know, they want our property. And we, as gardeners, we have to make sure that our sites are really looking fine. Because if the sites are not looking attractive and if it's it doesn't look like it's adding value, they say, well, what is our reason for existing? In our neighborhood, uh, the, the developers are buying up all the old houses and they think that they can get our gardens. And even though I, I say, you know, you see that leaf on, that means that it's not for sale. They think they can still circumvent the rules and the laws and they can buy. And yes, you know, my name have come up at developers meetings, I'm not even there. And, uh, you know, my neighbors would say, you know, Messina, your name came up and they were afraid of you. I said, afraid of me? I don't carry a gun or a weapon. 
but they know that, you know, I'm steadfast in holding on to our properties. And I let all my neighbors know, and they go into the bodega and tell the people, oh, you know, we're going to put up a 10-story building. And I said, Miss Ina, you said, I said, you see that? So they try to gaslight you. So keep our sites looking very good. Make it look like it should be there and it adds value because if it's run down, they will say, well, what is your reason for existing? Yeah. You could yep. put up a 10-story building there. And a footnote to that is that this unity does not serve us That's right. at this yes. point in history. Yeah. So we have to be unified. Gardens, garden members, um, partners and allies, this is a time for banding together yes. you know, in our communities. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, um, thank you, thank you. Yep, I have my mantras and that's one of them. Um, okay, so I'm gonna address this question to, more to this side of the room. Okay, has, and I know that you, your gardens do a lot of work as do yours with um, youth. Has the Department of Education shown an interest in partnering with community gardens as a viable way to enhance student learning? If so, how? And to me, this is a way to the future. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I think definitely over the years, you know, whether or not every school, because sometimes I think it's kind of up to the principal, you know, uh, but we've certainly had interaction with many, many schools every year, you know, classes come. And, uh, you know, we visited some schools and have encouraged them to, you know, use those big windows uh, for greenhousing uh, and, mm -hmm. and growing vegetables. And, and some certainly have. Wow. That's, that's great. I mean, there's a longer answer, but I yeah. think it's Oh, that's a perfect start. I think uh, we should add that we've had not only from the Board of Education, but we've had outside schools. I can't remember the name of the, the school. Private schools. Private schools that have come to, you know, colleges and universities that have come to, uh, to just look us over and see what we're doing, et cetera. Excellent. And help. And I know I've been impressed with the educational programs um, at Dunton Garden. Did yes. You say something um, about that? So there was the seed to plate program that started in one school three blocks away from the garden. Um, it turned into a program that literally went, I believe at the end was four different schools. Two of the schools had greenhouses um, and part of the seed to plate program became in one of the schools became their entire environmental science class. So we had uh, two other gardeners would go into the classroom and that would be their science class for the day was learning about from seed to plate. Amazing, amazing. And just let me see. Do we have we have like one minute for both of these panelists? And you both do very well known work with youth, but specifically with Department of Education. Has it been successful? Have have you been approached? Um, it's been successful for us because <clears throat> from the time that we started the youth in the garden. In 20, 2003, mm -hmm. we've always been in partnership with the schools up in Highbridge. Yeah. And they never forget about us. Even if we have an events, even if we're not having events, they actually have a bed in the garden. Wow. There's the schools there. Powerful. They have space there. Powerful, Sonia. So all our garden furniture were built by youths um, in Lyons Community School in Williamsburg. And uh, the attendees are kids from public housing that live around our garden. So that's empowerment in itself. Every bench, every gazebo, every pergola, except the new one we got from Green Thumb uh, two years ago. So all our infrastructure is built by youths and it, it means a lot to them. They're young adults now and they come back and it's very empowering because they live in public housing and they could look down on the garden and they feel very proud and empowered by it. They will say, you know, I helped to build that. And, you know, we have all their photos in the gazebo and yes. So um, it's partially, uh, you know, we, we are in community development. We empower our community. So they override 
whatever alliances we may make with public schools or other. It's just the children that live in our neighborhood, um, the members and first and second generation. So we're just grassroots community. Everybody that passed by remember and know us and um, that's our secret power is our community. Yes, and they support us 100%. We have never had a theft in 25 years. Mm -hmm. Three gardens, one, two, three. They have never broken because the gate was left open. They called me, are you here? I said, no, I'm in Kings County. They said, lock up, the garden is open. So it's the community, it's all about community. They are part of the legacy and the investment yes. of the gardens. This is amazing, so beautiful. Um, sadly, that's the, I think we've come to the end of our time. And I would ask that we end with appreciation for our speakers for Green Thumb NYC, support of our gardens today and throughout all seasons. And special thanks, even though she's not here, to Mara Gittleman of Green Thumb for coordinating our session. Thank you.